Hi guys, I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, so apologies. Um, so preparation for the lecture was a little bit in chaos because I got last minute invite and you know, there are a lot Thank of ta ta typos and so I will try to fix them later, but you know, at least we'll give you some, uh, some uh, slides and lecture today. So today at this, at this lecture, I want to really discuss with you uh, what we are building, like uh, what are the questions which we had to address during the design, and we are still in the design phase of the you know electron ion collider and the detector. And uh, just to remind you, I heard that like half of the participants are uh, experimentalists. Uh, this is really the great opportunities for you guys because the startup of the operation will happen in ten years from now. So you at that time you will get your degree and you know this is accelerator for you so welcome and i hope you will be uh, will join us with this uh, activity so uh, today uh, i will discuss about uh, the oh, how to start is it okay so i will uh, go over the uh, the detector acceptance uh, size location of the ec detector We'll talk about various uh, subcomponents and you know what are the challenges for the forward and backward uh, instrumentation. So you heard already a lecture by Douglas yesterday about the history, how this detector and EIC in general evolved. And uh, during my talk, I told like I took slides from various uh, conferences, you know, yellow reports and like uh, proposals. So I want to thank all the uh, my collaborators. Um, so, and as I, as I told, like I want to go with you. Like we we want to start and build the detector with you now. So uh, you are the scientist. So what the most uh, important question you need to address, right? So you want to collect as many data as possible, right? In your accelerator. And uh, of course, this those data uh, relates to the uh, cross section of of your science which you want to measure and the luminosity of your detector or of your accelerator. And also uh, there are two uh, coefficients like the acceptance and the detector efficiency. So that means, you know, in order to get as many data as possible, um, you have to build the high luminosity accelerator and you have to have the detector which is 100% efficient. That means there is like no dead time and uh, full acceptance. That means you want to cover whole pi and like detect all the particles which are emerging from the collision. Uh, when you talk about um, you know the uh, event kinematics, you will ask yourself, what type of the um, collider or experiment I want to build? Either I want to have the fixed target collider or the you know, of fixed target experiment or the collider experiment. And uh, as you know, here at Jefferson Lab, we all of our experiments are fixed target experiments. Uh, and there is a list of other fixed target experiments. Um, and the EIC, as you can see here, is a collider. So in order to answer the question, and as you can see here, the kinematic is very different. So in the fixed target, all of your particles uh, go forward. And you need to place a detector, you know, have a long detector, you know, along the one axis. And in, in case of the collider, uh, you want to detect the particles that are going all the full pi. So that means you have to cover everything around the, uh, the beam pipe. Uh, for you, I put a homework question, but maybe you are smart enough to do the calculations right away. So at EIC, we have the uh, electrons 18 GV, uh, protons 275, calculate the center of mass energy. You probably know already the answer. And just you know, consider that we want to have this experiment at a fixed target. So that means protons are at rest. Uh, what the energy of the uh, electrons we uh, should have here at Jefferson Lab if you want to have compete with a collider experiment. So please, you know, homework, or I will give you some, uh, probably one of the spoiler I will tell you. So we need to jump from the GV energy to the TV energy. 
just a spoiler. So, <laughs> but you can calculate and prove it. So uh, at the AC, we are building the total um, uh, acceptance detector. A total acceptance means that we have a four pi coverage, uh, but it's not really uh, um, as simple as uh, it's written here. So uh, we have we have to deliver the beam to the interaction region, uh, and of course, you know, the, all those uh, elements, which uh, you know, magnets, which we uh, we are using for the uh, delivering the beam, uh, they are limiting. Uh, space, they're limiting our kinematics, right? So we cannot place the detectors over here. Um, so that means it's really, um, uh, but the problem is that we really want to have everything, right? So we want to have measure all the particles. So that means we we also would like to integrate uh, some uh, forward detectors on one side and uh, on the backward side. And uh, this is really challenging. So it's, uh, you know, not all of the colliders in the world really doing that. Uh, and I will come to this later during my talk. So that means we need really like the far forward and far backward instrumentation. Uh, and as you can see probably from that uh, picture, we have a completely different uh, purpose of the, of the forward and backward region. So this is not as a collider, like the electron, electron collider when you just, you know, you collide and there is, uh, you know, annihilation and there is something that goes in only in the, to the central detector. Um, and we will see now why the uh, the end cups are different. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, with a scattered electron. So the DAS event, we we are interested in a scattered electron. So, but uh, in order to, you know, start building the detector, you need to understand where the scattered electron goes, right? So. Um, and using simple formulas, you can actually uh, create this uh, 2D graph and plot uh, energy of the scattered electron um, in this uh, x q square plane. Because all the scientists, as you know, you are interested in where is my kinematics, you know, where my event will be located. So there is an x and q square. Um, and uh, yeah. And you can see immediately from, from this plot that uh, most of the electrons actually will go to the electron end cup. And the higher the energy of your scattered electron, more towards the hadron end, end cup, it will sort of will scatter. Um, and uh, almost nothing or very high Q square area over here um, where your, or you, you know, with very high energy electron will be detected in a hadron end cup. Um, but from the other, and some of the events, as you can see, low low uh, Q square events, like below one, uh, will go all the way through the, you know, the end cups and go to the far backward region. A completely different story with, uh, with the quarks or with, uh, uh, you know, our jets, which are emerged or hadrons which are emerged from this quark, which uh, interacted with the electron. So they are tend to uh, go forward. Yeah, they are they tend to go forward. So following the, the, the proton direction and the higher the energy of those hadrons, more towards the far forward area they are sort of uh, going, right? So low, low energy lines we will probably detect here on the electron and cup in a barrel. But the, uh, the higher the energy of the hadrons, they mostly will go to the towards the they boost it towards the hadron end. Uh, and what is really interesting also in those plots that you know the 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 better you measure the energy of your electron, uh, just simple you know the formula, uh, the better you know your Q square. And as way around, the better you measure the energy of your uh, hadron or your quark. Uh, the better you know the X of your kinematics. So uh, here's a picture of the central detector. Again, so this is uh, not even a current. So it's it mentioned current, so it's not even current. So recently we had to modify a little bit the electromagnetic calorimeter in the barrel, but I will let you know. So this is one of the you know, half a year old picture. <laughs> Let's call it this way. 
So I will not go uh, into the details right now, but we will, um, you know, next slides, I will show all the subcomponents. Here on this uh, image, uh, slides, I just want to show you the dimension. So uh, 8.5 meters. So this is the dimensions of the, of the, um, the central detector. Uh, IP is in the middle, so protons coming from this side, electrons from that side. It's asymmetric, so 3.5 meters for the electron side and five meters for the hadron. And again, this is due to the boost of the of the um, yeah, of the kinematics towards the well uh, along the proton line. So uh, ah, I forgot to mention that uh, as you can see here, we have the cryostat that means all the central uh, tracking detectors are sitting inside the solenoid, inside the magnet. Why do the, we need the magnetic field? So we need to measure um, particle um, momentum and the charge. So in a homogeneous magnetic field, the motion of the charged particle is a helix, so it will start like bending. And what we are measuring is this sort of the curvature, right? Or the, the radius of the band. And uh, the stronger the field, um, the smaller the radius. Uh, that means they, they, they will bend more strongly. And also it depends on uh, what the energy of the particles. Um, so there is two like advantages or disadvantages of having the strong or too weak field. Um, so of course you want to avoid your particles to be bent to bend too strongly because otherwise they start spiraling and go along the beam pipe and you will not be able to measure them. Uh, but if your uh, field is too weak, then uh, the high energy particles you will not be able to separate them. So that means you will they they, they will simply will have the the same trajectory and you will not be able within this you know the one and a half meter uh, gap, you will not be able to see any separation. So that means, you know, there is a compromise. Uh, also about the size of the solenoid, um, you need to actually fit it into the experimental hole, right? You need to see that, you know, your experimental hole is capable of um, handling this, uh, this magnet. Um, and this is what you can see, uh, you know, the EIC detector inside the experimental hole at AP6. So there's a railing system, there is a door, so you have to move the detectors in and out uh, for maintenance. Um, there's, you know, the opening the end caps just to provide some, uh, you know, space for the uh, cables um, and the accelerator, you know, elements uh, on both sides. Yeah, so this is what you sort of uh, starting and you, of course, you ask yourself also, do I want to change the magnetic field during operation because uh, the energy of your collider will be different, will be a low energy, high energy operation. So uh, do you want to change also magnetic field? So well, this is a question which we have to address. So currently what we have for the EIC. So um, we originally started with um, uh, like a reuse of the Barbar uh, solenoid, uh, which is currently in use for the Exp Phoenix experiment. It provides 1.4 Tesla field, uh, but currently, but you know, it's already a reuse of the old equipment and it's aging. Yeah, so it's getting, so we need to do some maintenance of that. Um, so we decided that uh, probably 1.4 uh, uh, Tesla field is also not uh, uh, enough. So we, we are starting right now the design of the new solenoid with a similar, similar parameter. So this is a bore and the length, and, um, but uh, which will operate like up to two Tesla uh, field. So we at least we have some freedom. So it doesn't mean that we will operate constantly with this field, so, but we have some freedom to adjusting, uh, adjusting there. Um, uh, the field. Uh, and but we are planning to reuse, uh, you know, from this uh, S Phoenix configuration, we are planning to reuse some hadronic colorimeter and the flux returns. So there will be some uh, cost savings in that. So um, overall, our detectors, what we can call the general purpose detector. And as all the general purpose detectors, it has various layers. Um, a vertex detector we need, uh, tracking, 
particle identification, electromagnetic and hadronic collision. We do not have the muon detectors, so not planning, but we are, um, I will mention this, but uh, you know, we, nowadays with uh, machine learning te technique, we can identify the uh, muons uh, just looking at the uh, topology in various sub detectors. So um, now uh, coming to the sub detectors, to the choose of the technologies, we have, Currently, uh, more than 200 particles in the data particle uh, uh, group. So if you look at the you know, number of particles, so, and we, as I mentioned earlier in, in, in my talk, we have to measure them all. But fortunately for us that uh, we only 27 uh, particles out of 200 or more than 200 have a lifetime or that they can like run. Uh, longer than the one uh, micron. And only 13 have a lifetime greater than 500 micron. What does it mean 500? Just to give you a reference, 100 micron is the thickness of your hair. So after you know running uh, thickness of your hair, uh, we only have to deal with the uh, 13 particles. So it's already, you know, uh, uh, a good uh, sign. So uh, for all those 13 particles, uh, various particles, what we have to identify? Uh, we have to measure the particle momenta, origination, vertex, energy, and uh, identify them, right? So um, now we are coming to the question, why do we need uh, uh, to have the precision measurements of the particle momenta? So here's a uh, very simple example. So we have D0, so it's short life, uh, short lived particle. So it's uh, uh, lifetime is about 100 microns. It After 100 microns, it decays to the pi and k. So you just detect pi and k in your detector. And what you do is you just plot the invariant mass, right? So, and here is example of the invariant mass of the, uh, uh, the pi and the k. And Ideal situation, uh, we will have uh, the peak, you know, the delta function at the mass of the D0, right? But what if uh, uh, the momentum which you measure for those uh, final state particles are not, we, we do not know them as good as, uh, you know, as we want to. So if we apply this meaning to the momentum of those particles, you see this, uh, uh, Invariant mass spectra started to be you know, broader and broader, and if it's uh, you know even worse, like fifteen percent, you almost do not cannot separate and you cannot identify the D zero, right? So um, question, just varying the momentum of the, those particles. Uh, this is Monte Carlo. <laughs> I, I know the truth, so <laughs> this is Monte Carlo. Yeah, and um, and from those sort of the comparison plots, you you know you can definitely say, oh, I want something between like, you know, few percent, not of, of course not the the fifteen percent, right? So this will be the killer for me. So um, now it's coming back to the tracking detector. So that all like for the particle momentum, we need to know the particle trajectory. We need to understand the particle track. That means you need a tracking detector. So tracking detectors, um, it's like in our life, yeah? So you have uh, sand or snow, you have like animals jumping and you, you know, they sort of leaving the tracks and you can identify the path of the particle uh, of, of the, you know, animal. The same in the particle physics. So uh, particles interact, so they have to interact with the material detector in order to be detected there. Um, and uh, what you measure is a trajectory curvature, so you can identify the, the sign depending on you know which way it will bend in the magnetic field. And uh, yeah, so you can also identify the vertex. So this is example of the uh, photo emulsion. So it's all days fashion uh, uh, tracking detector. Um, uh, now, but nowadays, of course, we are already uh, not using uh, those photo emulsions, so they, we are using electronically uh, recordable tracks. 
right? So we need to, uh, so particles, when particles interact, they leave some energy. Uh, we need, and this is actually a curve showing how the particles are leaving the energy depending on their uh, properties. Um, and we we need to have the detector where we can sort of collect all this energy deposition in, you know, into our computers. Uh, and then we can, uh, you, know, uh, you know, analyze uh, and um, so we need to have uh, very good uh, space points. So that means we have to measure the particle, particle trajectory you know, with a high precision. Uh, we would like to measure charge. We would like to have, so we need a really the uh, magnetic field for that. Uh, we would like to measure also the, the angle of the particles where, where after the you know, origination. We would like to measure uh, primary and the secondary versus vertexes. And uh, what is also important, we would like to separate the multiple tracks. So if there is a multiple particles going in the same direction, we would like to separate them. Uh, of course, some of the detector provide uh, particle identification exactly based on the, the way how they interact with the material of the detector, uh, but uh, not all. So it's not uh, not always. So for EIC, we, we will not have this feature for the tracking detectors. And of course, we want to have the keep the minimum material. So um, because every time when particle interact with uh, with the material, it's losing the energy. But uh, you know, and at the, at the time when you know it reached the calorimeter, it would happen that it already will lose uh, quite some fraction of the energy. So um, momentum resolution. So there is a two factors main factors which are sort of contributing to the uh, momentum resolution. Uh, one, as I mentioned, uh, uh, what we call the multiple scattering. So this is amount of material uh, through which particles needs to travel. And uh, as you can see on this plot, it is not, it is absolutely not depending on the PT. So it's like constant uh, for uh, all momenta, uh, but it's really the properties of the, um, of the material this way. Um, and the, another uh, uh, term is uh, your uh, position resolution. So and this has a linear dependence on the PT, as you can see over here. Um, but if you plot the total, as you can see, so you can work very hard and improve the, 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 the special resolution or the pixel size of your uh, tracking detector. Uh, but uh, if your detector will be sick, you will never have the very good momentum resolution. So this is, you need to work on the boss. So you need to minimize the amount of material um, and also, you know, the granularity. So this is sort of the uh, thoughts which, uh, which you have to uh, keep in mind when you develop the tracking. Uh, also for the um, vertex detector, as I mentioned, some of the particles have the lifetime of, 100 to 300 uh, microns. And they are uh, like, after that running this, this distance, they, they decay. Um, and the problem, if you, you can say that, oh, let's place the detectors as close as possible. No, it is not possible because you need to uh, have the beam pipe. So you, you need to deliver the, the particle you know, beams. Um, and uh, everything will be inside the beam pipe. Yeah, so all your decays will happen inside the beam pipes and you will not have ability to place the detectors there. And the beam pipe at EIC is roughly, you know, 3.2 centimeters in radius. So uh, how you do this, of course, you do the extrapolation. So you, you measure only, you have the hits outside of the beam pipe, your tracking layers, and you sort of uh, try to see and, uh, if they are coming from the original IP or from the displaced vertex. Um, and uh, I mentioned about the material. Uh, uh, so we, we would like to minimize the material due to the multiple scattering effects. So in the central area of the EIC, we are going to have the beryllium section. Uh, uh, it will have a little bit of the gold uh, gold coating um, to sort of uh, absorb the synchrotron radiation because 
there will be some synchrotron radiation from the coming from the electron beam. And we need to make sure that at least the soft photons we uh, we will be able to uh, screen. Um, yeah, but this is sort of the uh, the way how we how we operate. So for in terms of the technologies, uh, we uh, we are choosing right now um, maps, monolithic pixel sensors. Um, it's uh, based on the ITS3. If you look at the CERN web page, you will find that this is the, the ongoing uh, uh, R&D and uh, development for the high luminosity uh, LHC. Um, disadvantages of this uh, of this system. So advantages of this system is that they have a very thin. Uh, 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 they are very thin. So. 50 micron uh, thick uh, detectors. So one of the you know smallest which you can can find there. The, and the pixel size are really um, uh, excellent. So the from 10 to 20 microns. But the integration time of those detectors are huge. So the integration time is uh, uh, order of uh, 10 microns. And this is the will be the you know one of the challenging um, aspects for the AIC, where the repetition rate of the bunches are um, every, I don't know, 10 nanoseconds. But, you know, the AS events will not happen every 10 nanoseconds, but nevertheless, 10, 10 uh, microseconds, quite a uh, large time for the readout. Uh, and for the uh, the outer layers, we are planning to use uh, MPGD uh, detectors. They are, their resolution is uh, slightly uh, uh, verse uh, about uh, 100 microns, uh, but they are cheaper. Yeah, so we 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 are not uh, you know afford ourselves to uh, uh, cover with a silicon uh, I don't know two meters long detectors. So um, here you can see the layout. Uh, we have not only the barrel layers but also the the end cups. As I mentioned before, us the, the the end cups are really important because this will help us with the electrons, scattering electrons, this with the, with the hadrons. Um, and also you have to keep in mind that there will be um, a difference how the charged particles and the photons interact with the material. So for the charged particle, there will be sort of the hits and you reconstruct the, the trajectory, but the photons, uh, depending of course on the energy, uh, they, first of all, their trajectory is straight because they do not have a charge. And uh, you know, depending on the energy, again, uh, they are leaving uh, heat. So that means they are depositing the energy in a in a single layer. Um, but it could happen that if the energy is too high, they can just simply escape and will be detected in a calorimeter later on. Uh, but taking into account these properties of the of the photons. Uh, we already can predict that the synchrotron radiation, which is the, the scattered electro, uh, which the electron is sort of uh, uh, from the from the bunches of producing, will create us uh, some sort of um, extra background, and the particle reconstruction will be really challenging. Uh, so this is again uh, properties of the vertex detector and uh, like the layout, as you can see in the close view. Uh, so really low material budget detector so it's uh, um, you know per layer it will be uh, not even a percent um and so right now the ellis is planning to use it and uh, yeah so we are still uh, going r d for this detector uh, uh, and you can see the, the the distance of closest approach so that means how well uh, um, we can reconstruct the vertex with with this technology for the uh, MPGD, uh, as I mentioned, the resolution, special resolution is not uh, as good. So, but in a, in a uh, barrel, we are planning to have the, this um, uh, circular uh, uh, MPGD detectors. We are still going again. Uh, there is R and D on uh, type. Uh, what type of MPGD technologies to use? But you can see, you can compare what uh, the special resolution we can. Uh, uh, sort of expect for the type of detector, and uh, this is, we really can uh, cover a large area, and uh, you know the price of those detectors are very, very cheap. 
Um, again, so I mentioned the synchrotron radiation, but the synchrotron radiation is not really like the uh, one of the sources. So we have uh, also the beam gas event. So if the vacuum inside your you know accelerator system will not be as good as uh, you would uh, like, so uh, on the top of your DIS event there will be this this garbage, right? So and this will provide again a lot of um, data, and uh, so you would have to see if the you can uh, reconstruct the tracks with uh, with the, such events on the top. And of course, we are uh, worrying about um, uh, the radiation hardness of our detectors, but as the simulation shows that it's only for the forward area. So this example of the slow neutrons and uh, like, you know, the radiation, as you can see there is, will be some hot spots uh, close to the beam pipe. Um, yeah, so now switching, yeah, we have. So now we are switching to the particle identification. So I mentioned that we have to identify only 13 particles, which is already good. Uh, and the, actually this is a list of particles which we need to identify. So electrons, positrons, gammas, so jet we are, we are calling the, the bunch of the collimated particles, um, individual hadrons, pions, kinds, protons, muons, uh, neutrons, and uh, like neutral hadrons, like, you know, neutrons and halons. Uh, neutrino, we are not detect detecting. So neutrinos, uh, the only way to identify neutrinos is by measuring the missing PT. So if they will be, uh, you know, you, you collect the data from your detector and you see that there is uh, some disbalance between your scattered electron and uh, uh, the hadrons. So you can say, okay, that was a neutrino. So this way we can identify. And this is a, the way how we actually dealing with uh, charge current uh, reactions. Um, again, by looking at the topology, so you can uh, look at the, uh, how the particles interact with the various detectors, if they provide the track or the cluster in the calorimeter. So by using this, but most uh, challenging parts are, um, those um, hadrons, charged uh, charged hadrons, like pions, kions, and the protons. For them, we need to have, so we cannot really like separate them by looking at the topology in various detectors. So we need to have the special detectors, uh, basically uh, based on the Cherenkov um, detector technologies in order to identify them. So, and here's an example, again, as I told, like I'm trying to link the physics and the, to the detector. So um, here's an example uh, why we need the PID. Um, and the example coming again from my uh, favorite uh, topics, uh, charm production, so Dimizon. So we have an example of the uh, uh, D-star production, boson gluon fusion at the ESC. Uh, and uh, we, uh, or maybe probably I will better jump to the spectra. So we have the D0 again, uh, decaying to the pine and cans. We are plotting invariant mass on the top of the DIS background. So this is just DIS, no other, you know, background synchrotron or whatever. So just the DIS. And now you want to identify your D0. So if you do not have the PID or vertex detector, what you will see is just a combinatorial background, yeah? So no even a, a sign uh, for the D0. But if you apply some PID and uh, still do not have the vertex detector, so uh, you probably will be able to just uh, get a sort of hint that there is something. But of course, with a good vertex detector and with PID, so uh, in this case, we assume 25%, so at ESC we, we can do the better, I hope. Um, and uh, with some 80% uh, taking into account the efficiency of the PID detectors. So this is uh, what we are uh, expecting. So that means we really need to have the uh, well, PID detectors. So uh, now let's check uh, where those charged hadrons will go. So if you plot, uh, uh, select just the charged hadrons, their momenta and the field rapidity or angle, you immediately will see that most of the hadrons will be boosted towards the hadron end cap. Again, so this plot which I showed to you, 
um, and the the uh, the high energy hadrons will be detected in the hadron end cap uh, in the barrel maybe five I don't know six GV and uh, up to ten GV uh, here in the electron end cap. So that means you have to look at the spectra and sort of assign what kind of technologies you have to apply for various regions, right? And this is exactly what we are doing. So for the backward uh, region, so for the electron end cup, which is over here or this area, um, we are planning to use uh, proximity focusing reach. Um, it's aerogel based uh, detector, Cherenkov detector. Uh, threshold um, uh, for the electron identification. And, uh, you know, there is some expansion volume, of course. So this type of the detector will provide pion can separation up to 10 GV. So 10 GV, looking at this, so it's up to here, right? We are good to go. So for the barrel, uh, this is really important because uh, in the barrel, as long as we do not have much of space, uh, we decided to use uh, 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 the high performance uh, Dirk detector. It's readily compact, as you can see those bars um, uh, located over here, uh, around to the, you know, next to the, uh, inside the, the, the solenoid. Uh, and um, uh, uh, we only need the five centimeter space. So the thickness of those bars is only five centimeters. So, and um, with better optics and with good timing, for your, you know, readout, uh, we can uh, get pi k separation up to uh, six GV, which is actually also good because we are in a in a barrel region, so we do not really need um, too much of the momentum coverage. But for the forward area, where the most of the hadrons will go, um, we decided to use a dual radiator ridge. Um, it provides the pines and gain separation up to 50 GV. As you can see, it has a two uh, dual radiator, means it has two radiators. It has an aerogel and a gas. And, uh, you know, depending on the momentum area, either one or another uh, sort of contributes to the uh, PID. Uh, and this is how uh, the detectors looks inside the, the central detector. So you can see the uh, Dirk bars over here. So with this expansion volume, uh, we have the uh, over here the uh, proximity focusing reach. So right after the tracking, and we have the dual radiator reach. As you can see, it's really like taking a lot of uh, space, but um, we really need this in order to uh, get some PID identification. And we also have the um, the time of flight detectors. Um, Time of flight, um, I probably, I don't know, should I go? So maybe just with a few words. So time of flight, we really need to cover the low um, low momentum region. And it's uh, the, the the principle of operation is based on, um, uh, on the differences in mass and the, you know, the flight time. Uh, it, typically in a, in a, um, in a fixed target experiments, you have like the start detector, stop detector. You just measure the the time of arrival of each particle, and then taking into account that you know the lengths, uh, you can simply you know uh, uh, plot the, the differences, and uh, you can identify the mass difference of those particles. But in a um, in a collider situation, it's not as simple because uh, you, you do not have a space to to place the start detector and the, your interaction starting here, the you know, uh, inside the beam pipe and uh, your particle starting to curve and uh, what you measure if you place the, your top detector at some, some distance. So you just, uh, you know, you need, you do not have the T0, so you need to find a way how to really, uh, you know, uh, start your clock. Um, but right now we are using the uh, different, slightly different technologies and for the fixed target experiments. We are not actually, you know, using, as I mentioned, the start detectors, but what we are doing, we are just uh, measuring the, 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 uh, this curve very precise. And we have very high uh, resolution uh, detectors for this, uh, the, the, the stop clock. And by that we can sort of, uh, you know, predict what uh, what time is needed for the particles to travel from the IP to this point. 
Uh, and for that technology, we are planning to use the ACL guard um, and uh, their, uh, their resolution. So they, they, those detectors can provide the timing up to 20 picosecond. So it's really uh, cool. Um, and this is sort of, again, uh, momentum versus field rapidity or angle of the particles showing what the uh, various uh, detectors will cover um, and ACL guards for the time of flight over here. Uh, of course, it's uh, I need to mention the readout because uh, for those Cherenkov detectors, you have to measure the, the light. And uh, there is two uh, different uh, readouts, uh, PMT and Psi PMs. Uh, for, you know, they are both good, and but some have advantages, some disadvantages for the PMT. They have good uh, linearity, uh, but uh, they are very sensitive to the magnetic field, so you cannot place them inside the solenoid. Uh, but for the Psi PMs, uh, really, you know, they're, they're, they, first of all, they are very compact, um, but and they have this the single photon sensitivities, but because they have this uh, uh, single photon sensitivity, they have very huge uh, dark uh, noise. So and this is really like the compromise what what you want to use. Yeah. So again, for this type of detectors, you will have to have to deal with a uh, huge traffic. So how your data acquisition will handle this question. Um, this detector I want to mention because I am a part of this R and D, uh, but we are not planning to use it for the first detector. But it will be either upgrade or the second detector uh, um, uh, option. Uh, I, I didn't mention the the electron identification at all, even though that Cherenkov detectors provide some. But uh, in some areas, especially in the forward hadron end cap. Um, the the flux of the pions and case will, will be such high that um, you know we probably can miss the electron. Not probably, but like hundred percent will miss the electron. And some pions or cations will mimic the electron, which is you know what we want to sort of avoid. And for uh, additional detectors in this area, so we are proposing the transition radiation detector, and these detectors actually. Um, uh, you know, the, the principle of operation is uh, such that, you know, typically pions produce only uh, the energy deposition in the gas volume, while the, when the electron uh, travels through the radiator, it produces uh, transition radiation photons. And when you detect this on you know, top of the energy deposition, you also have the uh, huge cluster from the transition radiation photons. And uh, yeah, so this is sort of... Uh, uh, of course, you're using this in addition to the calorimeter and Cherenkov detectors, but you know you have to keep in mind that those detectors have some space. And this is actually the real data. So this is how the track, real track in a test beam um, yeah, looks like. So there's a clusters and we are online uh, you know, fitting this with a... Um, yeah, so now uh, switching to the calorimeter, Probably will have to go fast. Um, we are uh, so we are um, yeah. As you can see from this plot, so uh, for some reason we probably do not need really the calorimeter. So we would be enough to have the tracking detectors because tracking detectors provide better resolution for the for the uh, compared to the calorimeters, but. Uh, not in all region, yeah. So uh, sometimes uh, we really need uh, to have the external uh, detector, and um, and also uh, we cannot measure the neutral particles. So calorimeter is the only way to to get the energy uh, from the. So if you have the if you have the tracking detectors and the good PID, you do not need the calorimeter. This is what I'm going to say. But in some areas, uh, uh, you you still you know. Uh, clarimeter provides a better resolution. Uh, okay, so this I probably will skip. So there's a two types of the calorimeters, sampling calorimeters and the homogeneous calorimeters. Uh, they, you know, they're all good, but uh, you know, they 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 serving. Uh, they have slightly different uh, resolution. Uh, at the EIC, we are planning to have. Um, the homogeneous uh, 
lead tungsten calorimeters in an electron end cup because the, this is this technology really can provide very 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 high uh, energy resolution so one of the best in the world um and for the forward and the bar so for the barrel we currently as you can see the slightly different uh, layout than in a you know uh, 2d plot which i show you for the entire detector so we recently had a um, review what type of uh, detectors to have, clarimeters to have in a um, barrel AM call. And that the decision was that we want to have the imaging clarimeters. That means there will be some you know, absorbers with scintillating you know, fibers here and uh, imaging layers based on the uh, AstroPix detector. So we have a very high uh, you know, position uh, information uh, on uh, how the cluster is uh, developing in, in this uh, barrel area. And for the forward team call, we are, and actually it will be as a combination with H call, we are planning to have the uh, toxin sci fi, so it's uh, scintillators, again, scintillator based um, uh, uh, technology. Uh, for a few words about the crystals, so we, they are really widely used in uh, like CMS or Panda experiment, very high resolution. A problem with this um, that uh, there's only two vendors that provide uh, or grow those crystals. And we are right now uh, doing the uh, sort of uh, choosing the which one uh, to, to use for purchasing. And, um, and uh, so the, we, we need actually, so for CMS, in order to like grow all the crystals, which they need, it took almost 10 years. So that means if we, we need to really start now um, uh, because growing each crystal takes two days to grow. So we, we need to um, start now. And those crystals are quite heavy. So 1.5 kilo per each module. Um, yeah, and again, on this plot, you can see the comparison of the resolution, energy resolution. Um, uh, let's say uh, this is actually the what, what, what we had. So let me see what is it. Um, yeah, this uh, uh, blue over here is uh, crystals, as you can see, the best uh, uh, possible calorimeter in the world. And this is the you know requirements coming from the physics. As you can see, it's uh, really beyond the the, the requirements. Uh, for the barrel, uh, we have we had the two options. Uh, one is the the side glass, and one is the imaging detectors. And we decided to choose the imaging uh, colorimeter. And for the forward, which is a green green curve over here. Uh, it's, uh, but uh, we, we, are, we are not really worrying about the 10% uh, uh, resolution because, you know, the, the energy of the particles will be really high. Uh, so this is, you can see assembly, um, the, the, the electron uh, colorimeter here, here, hadronic colorimeter on, on, uh, on both sets. So this will be also like tail catcher. So there'll be some um, like end cup. Uh, instrumentation. So again, there's a sampling calorimeter example, how they, you can see the, the scintillating fibers, um, quite compact. So we are using the the the, uh, the iron and the tungsten um, material. Uh, again, you can compare resolution and how it uh, relates to the depth. So um, you can see quite, quite, um, uh, large uh, detectors. So uh, the, the again, you can use the colorimeter for the particle identification by looking at the different profile of the shower. Also, you can identify the muons with uh, with um, uh, with the colorimeter. So, and what is really important that uh, we need to have the good electron hadron separation because some of the hadrons start sort of producing the shower already in the electromagnetic section and can mimic the electron and also uh, the pi zero to, to gamma contributes. So, uh, I mentioned about the material, oops, yeah. uh, material budget. Um, so this is really important. So this plot probably out of date is from the H uh, simulation, but uh, we are not really far away from the H design. So uh, this is sort of in terms of the radiation links, what will be the material in front 
of the colorimeter. Uh, yeah, now we are in the, we still have a few minutes. I will try to do. Uh, so physics in a forward and a backward really important because in some of the events we have um, we have protons which are sort of uh, stay as as it is. So without um, you know only getting the kick some kick without breaking apart. Um, and some like vector meson production, so you can see here, so on a gold and um, some diffraction events. Um, so we need the instrumentation in the forward area. And uh, this is an example uh, of the central detector and the interaction region plus minus 40 meters. So as you can see, we have some components along this line. Um, both areas serve a different purpose. Um, as I told, like this is mostly for the low Q square, for this uh, measuring the scattered electron. This is for the measuring the hadrons and the and the protons. Uh, for the far forward area in the hadron direction, we have the B zero detectors. Um, they they will be sitting in a uh, specially designed dipole, and um, we have a Roman ports. We have a, a zero degree colorimeter, so they are really like you know forty meters away from the interaction region. Um, uh, let me skip this one. So again, this is the example of the B0 detector. So the, the layers will be sitting inside this magnet. We only have like, you know, limited uh, uh, space where we can place it. Uh, it will cover from five to 20 milliarad um, uh, 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 cone of the particles. And uh, of course, you know, we, we need to design it such that, you know, the uh, it can provide also reasonable um, uh, PT uh, resolution. So right now we are still debating what kind of technologies to use because we, because of the high multiplicity in this area, we probably will not be uh, able to use the uh, ITS3 technologies, but um, most likely we need some um, good timing, like, you know, and we, uh, most likely we will use the uh, the, the similar technology as for the uh, time of flight, but with uh, granularity, uh, not with a strip, but with, uh, uh, you know, pixelized detector. And um, also at the end, we are planning to use either a colorimeter or uh, some um, pre shower uh, in order to detect photons. Um, so challenging integration in terms of the detector integration, as you can see here, we, you know, colorimeter blocks, uh, full layers of the tracking. We do not have access from that end because of the accelerator, uh, you know, components will sit here. In front, we also do not have access because there will be vacuum pumps. So we are right now finding a way how to do this overall integration of the detector. For the Roman ports, um, those detectors actually uh, they uh, have to go as close as possible, uh, actually ten sigma away from the core of the uh, of the of the beam, um, and you can see the layout. Um, it, they will be movable, so we will be move them in and out, uh, you know, during the injection and during the operation, and uh, we need to have them integrated in a vacuum. Um, and uh, so overall, this is really a complicated system. Um, do I have the slides? Okay. Uh, we also need to, in terms of the physics, we also need to look at the, uh, not only at the pixel size, but uh, how the uh, smearing of the um, primary vertex contributes and also the crop rotation, which, you know, uh, Douglas mentioned the last time. Um, and, uh, but on this plot, you can see how this actually nicely matched uh, the, the B0, which I mentioned, and the Roman pot. So uh, the, the entire spectra we are covering either with that or with another, you know, detector technologies and, you know, location. So there will be two modes of operation of the accelerator. Um, I will not, I do not have a time to go over this, but you know, that you have to keep in mind that one will be with a high luminosity, one will be with lower luminosity. So there will be some also compromise on uh, what, what to use. There will be, uh, we also need the off momentum detectors for the momentum, which have uh, different magnetic rigidity um, with respect to the, you know, the original beam. Um, and we are planning to have the two sets of the, what we call the off-momentum detectors, so for, for that purpose. 
Um, also, uh, we have a particles uh, like the lambdas, uh, which decay to the proton and pi minus, and that means we need to also uh, be able to measure the, the negative uh, uh, pi ions, and they will bend into the different uh, direction uh, by, by those two dipoles, dipole fields. So, and they will have also a uh, lifetime, which uh, order of meters. Um, and so we are planning also to placing the uh, detectors on the, on the other side of the, of the beam. And this, you can see the integration challenge. So two off-momentum detectors and the Roman port. So we integrated with the beam. So it's quite, quite heavy um, construction. Uh, zero degree calorimeter, we'll see. So this is the IP central detector, which I described. So zero degree is sitting uh, almost 40 meters away. Um, and we needed to uh, measure the photons and the neutrons. Uh, so the acceptance is uh, shown over here. It has a multiple structure. I uh, probably will not go over the uh, technologies, but you can, you can use them. You, see, you can see them here. Um, and uh, it will provide quite a good, um, you know, and uh, uh, reconstruction of the energy for the for the neutrons. Uh, for backward areas, actually design um, for the uh, low Q square measurements for the photo production for the Q square below one GV. As you can see here, the acceptance of the central detector and the and the taggers. And uh, yeah, so and the, we will have the lumen detector. So the tagger one, tagger two and the Lumi system uh, sitting over here. So um, let me also jump, say a few words about data acquisition system. Uh, it's a huge data traffic. So the, uh, the, the AC data rates is expected at an order of uh, uh, 50 kilohertz, it's only physics. So on the top will be noise, will be, uh, um, I don't know, background. So it's order of uh, hundreds of gigabit per second. So we need to read them from the detector with ASICs, uh, via fibers, and somehow uh, reduce the the amount of data on the fly, and then you know store them on a the disk. So um, I want to mention the AI for ML. I know that for you guys this is really a you know, hot topic. Uh, at ESC, a lot of opportunities, and we are sort of using um, the AI and, and um, algorithms for various uh, the data analysis and uh, for various detectors uh, you mentioned here. So this example, how we do the, for example, the identification of the detectors or the cluster separation and the calorimeter. Um, one of the important uh, also aspects of uh, applying the machine learning techniques is for the online data processing and the way, you know, we need something with a low latency uh, because we have to really, you know, um, make the decision on, on the fly and uh, the FPGA based uh, machine learning is right now under development. And I just want to use this opportunity to uh, mention this workshop, uh, which we are planning to have. There is a lot of tutorials and various, um, uh, what we call the hackathons uh, for, you know, related to the AI for EIC. So please uh, join. And this is my summary. Yeah, so we have detector-driven design. It's general purpose detector. We are still doing the R and D, uh, and yeah, I hope you join us. So earlier you mentioned that um, machine learning was being used to detect muons and other detector layers. Um, can you comment on how that's done, or what's unique about that? Um, so we don't have um, space to place the muon detectors um, and uh, compared to the other, you know, the experiments, uh, we are not planning to measure the uh, the muon momenta in the, in the, like the outer uh, radius. So we have to rely on the measuring of the momentum inside the tracking detectors. So the, the, the you know, the one which we have already and on the calorimetry. So on the calorimetry, muons uh, typically provide, um, you know, just, um, you know, basic MIP signal. Uh, and uh, they, they are not stopping here, so they, they will fly further. 
Um, and since we have the, the electromagnetic and the hadronic calorimetry, uh, let me just go back. So we are, what the idea is, and uh, I, I saw a couple of demonstration during the, you know, one of the, our calorimetry meetings. Um, unfortunately, uh, guys, I didn't have the chance to place them here. And um, so what muons, so they provide, so they, they will leave the track, right? They will have some energy deposition in the electromagnetic and hadronic calorimetry. And when you combine this information and compare with the signals from the like electron and the, with the pines, you immediately will be able to, to identify it. Because you know the, the, the energy which they are, they are typically losing are really like minimal. Yeah. And um, of course, they are, you know uh, would be good to have the tracking detectors also providing some you know energy deposition measurements. Because you can also use this energy deposition uh, inside the tracking to, you know, uh, get for the low momentum muons some identification. But unfortunately, we, you know, our tracking detectors will not have this option. Thank you. I kind of want to build on his question. Uh, in order to use machine learning techniques, we gotta have training data. So how do how are you training that? Is it with Monte Carlo simulation so, that uh, or something else? There, there are a lot of uh, possibilities. First of all, you can train it with Monte Carlo. Yeah, it's like you know when you start just start building the detector, you just you know place your detector, you you know you use you know hit it with uh, some single particles muons. You know perfectly uh, ID of these particles, and you can use it for the identification. And then when you sort of advance your design, you're already starting to have the test beam data. Yeah, so because you're building already the detector, you know the response, so you just, you know, try to use the real data from the test beam in order to see how to identify yeah. it. Yeah, this is the way how we sort of- uh, You iterate it. on the- You we it and we iterate. Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. If you could go back to slide 28, um, I wasn't sure what you meant by expansion volume in the detector. Yeah, under like um, like backward PID, yeah, it says requires expansion volume. Like, what is that referring to? So it's actually the 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 way how you uh, place your sensor detectors. You how far away from your aerogel radiator you place your sensor detectors. Or oh, that means you know how large your optimum, um, your sort of projected. Uh, uh, cone of the Cherenkov detectors will be, yeah. So you I can see. place it right. So like here we have the mirrors, but uh, here you have to rely on uh, like the the natural path. Yeah. Okay. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so is there actually an angle when where the collision happens? Yes. We Why have, is we have twenty five millirad crossing angle. And I hope that um, Douglas showed it already to you. Let me probably go uh, backwards. So this the um, the main reason. So one one of the reason um, uh, for this crossing angle is to provide some instrumentation uh, for the forward and the backward region. But this is not really the main driver. Let's see. Let's see. We can... Yeah, this one. So this is the crossing angle, electrons coming. Of course, it's you know a little bit exaggerated uh, in a view. So we have 25 millirad, so electrons coming from this side, hadrons coming from that side. Uh, and um, you know, when when they are inside the tunnel, so the the, the distribution of the um of the bunches are sort of flat along the, the z-axis or along the oops trajectory distance, but uh, when we go closer to the interaction, we want to have the maximum uh, interference between the benches. So we want to have, so if they, they will be, uh, you know, like that and the uh, flat, right? So the, the cross section for the interaction will be very small. So we want to rotate them 
so that when they are at IP, they are sort of hand on and like hundred percent overlap. Um, so is the twenty five milliradian is that a an optimized angle? Uh, this is sort of optimized angle at uh, here at JLab when we had um, when we had this um, uh, design we had uh, fifty millirad. Um, but uh, for the electron ion collider at BNL, this is sort of the the. Does it does it depend on the uh, center of mass? Should it be changing? Right now? Um, it is not depending on center of mass because they you know accelerator people can adjust uh, with the uh, magnetic field of the accelerator. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, but also you know one of the, of the purpose also to have the. Um, uh, you know, the instrumentation, because, you know, when you separate the beams, then you, you know, you can have more rooms to place your detectors here and there. Yeah. For the DAQ system, the front end, the FPGAs, are they like, sort of like, on the board itself of the front end electronics, or uh, a separate system? It's still under development. Some of okay. them are really close to the detector. Some of them are uh, um, close to the computing farm, let's call it this way. It's still uh, under the question what we, what sort of um, we are finally going to use for the, where is it? It's 63, okay. I think. Yes. So uh, it's still uh, under under development. We we do not, because we are, as you can see, so we, we are still using the uh, uh, deciding on what kind of technologies we we we, we want to use. So uh, various technologies, as I mentioned, they have the they uh, they are planning to have the uh, pre-processing right, you know, next to the the detector and only like send the cluster or like heat no heat information. And some of the uh, detectors will sort of rely on, uh, you know. There will be also FPGAs uh, related, for example, for the like track finding. So I actually skipped this this slide, uh, but maybe this is actually the good uh, way to to discuss this. So we are developing this for our uh, transition radiation detector. So this is a compact detector, but it has all the features. So like we have the like pattern recognition, we have the track fitting, and we also have the PID. So that means into the FPGA board, we can sort of uh, feed all the, you know, uh, uh, those algorithms into the like single FPGA board and do all the processing on the fly. So for us, it's just taking, I don't know, a uh, few nanoseconds or 100 nanoseconds, depending on what, what we really need. Um, and, uh, but, some detectors, they do not want to lose the information, so they want to store everything, including the noise and including the background hits. It really depends <laughs> on the need, right? Because, you know, once you do the pre-processing on FPGA, especially, you know, uh, any pre-processing, it doesn't matter if it's uh, machine learning or not, you, you will lose something, right? And uh, in ideal situation, you want to store everything. But in this case, you need to build a huge farm. And, and then you have to have billions of students who will analyze this data, right? <laughs> so maybe it's a good sign for you. But yeah. so, because right now, the problem is with, uh, with the current uh, data that um, we, the storage is cheap. So you can you know, put everything to the storage. But then, you know you need to have a mechanism to read this out and analyze, right? Otherwise it will be like a garbage, right? And actually, if you uh, look at the, um, the uh, HERA or CERN data, 99% of the stored data is the background or garbage, 99%. And only 1% is sort of good data which you can use for the publication. And but you have to store everything, right? And you have to dig this out and analyze. So, yeah, Thank that's you. why we want to have the all garbage uh, to be removed during the pre-processing, and only store like you know, brilliant new events beyond the standard model or improve the standard model. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you.